Welcome to the Good News Ride Home for Tuesday, May 19th, 2020. I'm Jackson Bird. Testing is expanding in the U.S., but people aren't showing up for it. A new nationwide antibody study and more findings on people who test positive again after recovering. Plus, debunking misconceptions about the 1918 flu pandemic, why we might be seeing an animation renaissance, and is Etsy the new Grubhub? Starting today with some numbers, the U.S. death toll has passed 90,000 with more than a million and a half confirmed cases. India has just passed 100,000 cases, matching the number of ICU beds in the country. And death certificates in Mexico City suggest the fatalities from coronavirus there may be three times higher than official reports. Some better news out of Italy, though. Their death toll has dipped below 100 in a 24-hour period for the first time in 10 weeks. The U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention is planning a nationwide antibody study in 25 metropolitan areas to track how the virus is spreading. The study will begin this summer and extend into next year. While many people turned to the news more than usual at the outset of the pandemic, trends have swung to the opposite end of the pendulum, and now 22% of people in the UK say that they often or always actively try to avoid the news, up from 15% in mid-April, according to a recent study by the Reuters Institute at Oxford. Quoting the survey's fact sheet, The vast majority of those who always or often avoid the news, 86%, say that they are trying to avoid COVID-19 news at least some of the time, and most of them said they're primarily worried about the effect that it has on their mood, 66%, end quote. Greenpeace Germany is warning that restrictions around and concerns about public transportation will lead to a spike in road traffic. But meanwhile, the New York Times reports the U.S. is already seeing a shortage of bicycles as more people turn to the more affordable, greener option. And the global supply chain disrupted by the pandemic struggles to meet demand. The Atlantic's COVID tracking project has just released an assessment of the CDC's data reporting showing where their reporting differs from state-level official reporting and state health department reporting. Link to peruse the white paper is in the show notes. A quick follow-up to the thermal scanners. I mentioned yesterday that the TSA is trying to implement and how some at both the TSA and the CDC oppose them. Well, the ACLU has now also come out against thermal scanners, saying that the false sense of security they may provide, as well as the myriad of ways they can be ineffective, make them not worth the potential risk of leading to permanent forms of surveillance and social control. In news that feels almost too on the nose for history, the pandemic may cause Shakespeare's Globe Theater in London to shut down permanently. While the playhouses were often closed due to health concerns related to the plague back in Shakespeare's time, this recreation of the theater built in 1997 has already been shut down as part of London's lockdown and is therefore at risk of shutting permanently as it loses its main revenue streams of ticket sales and guided tours. And finally, a Baltimore-based bar may have found the answer to safely reopening. The Fishtails Bar has made bumper tables for social distancing, which basically look like small individual standing tables on wheels surrounded by a big inner tube. The concept allows patrons to still walk around and interact with one another, but from a safe distance. The link in the show notes includes a video from the bar showing off these tables, and I highly suggest you go watch because you've really got to see these to appreciate them. As testing capacity in many U.S. states finally ramps up, a new problem is surfacing. Not enough people showing up to get tested. Quoting the Washington Post, A White House estimate obtained by the Post shows the nation has sufficient lab capacity to process at least 400,000 tests per day, and potentially more. But in surveying the states, the Post found that few are testing at full capacity. In 20 states that provided detailed information, the number of tests performed was roughly 235,000 per day lower than their technical capacity, with the biggest gaps in California and New Jersey, end quote. 
In Wisconsin, where officials report a daily capacity of 13,400 tests, only 4,800 people on average have shown up each day. In Florida, they're averaging about half of the state's 30,000 daily capacity. And in Arizona, officials hoped 10,000 people would get tested at a statewide testing blitz on May 2nd, but only 5,400 people actually showed up. So why aren't people getting tested? Experts have a number of theories, including lack of access in rural and underserved communities, lack of health care and related concerns about payment, a confusion about who qualifies for a test or if there are enough available, a sense that for those who are mildly symptomatic, a test wouldn't change their behavior anyways, and a general skepticism about the tests. A number of states have relaxed their testing restrictions, encouraging anyone, whether symptomatic or not, to get tested. Local health departments are also doing what they can to expand awareness and access in particularly hard-hit populations by setting up pop-up testing centers, spreading information via apps, and even erecting billboards directing people to go get tested. Other locations, meanwhile, are still experiencing supply shortages. In Chicago last week, a major chain of urgent care clinics had to pause mobile testing when it ran out of test kits, and Governor Newsom says that California is not meeting its daily lab capacity due to supply chain constraints. Quoting again from the Post, According to the COVID tracking project, the nation is currently testing about 330,000 people a day, a rate that, if sustained, would cover about 3% of the population a month. That's double last month's average, achieving a goal set by the White House, but still far short of the number most independent analysts say will be needed to avoid another wave of death and illness in the months ahead. Last week, Dr. Ashish Jha and other Harvard researchers estimated that the United States should be testing at least 900,000 people per day, or about 8% of the population per month, end quote. Among the many big questions surrounding coronavirus are, can you catch it again after you've recovered, and can you spread it after you've recovered? There have been fears reinfection is possible after a number of patients tested positive for COVID-19 after having previously tested negative and recovered from all symptoms. But a new study from the Korean Centers for Disease Control and Prevention of 285 such individuals showed that these so-called repositive patients, quoting Bloomberg, weren't found to have spread any lingering infection and virus samples collected from them couldn't be grown in culture, indicating the patients were shedding non-infectious or dead virus particles, end quote. These findings suggest that those who have recovered do not present a risk of spreading coronavirus and may be a stepping stone to the question of whether antibodies will convey some protection from the virus. Using these findings, South Korea is amending its protocols that individuals receive a negative test in order to return to work or school. The diagnostic PCR tests, quote, can't distinguish between dead and viable virus particles, potentially giving the wrong impression that someone who tests positive for the virus remains infectious, end quote. Therefore, at least in South Korea now, a person just needs to have recovered and ended their period of isolation in order to return to work or school. Ever since the coronavirus really started spreading around the world at the start of the year, there were immediately comparisons being made to the 1918 flu pandemic, trying to predict what we might face based on what happened then, looking for answers or hope in how people fared, what got them through. Since the events of a century ago have become almost a buzzword these days, I wanted to take some time to share a few facts and debunk a couple of misconceptions about the 1918 pandemic. Maybe you had a better education than I did, but I don't remember learning too much about the 1918 flu pandemic in school. It was only mentioned in passing, and my primary understanding of it comes from the second most tragic episode of Downton Abbey, in which they refer to it as the Spanish flu, which brings me to my first point to debunk. Even though it has often been referred to as the Spanish flu, it didn't originate in Spain. Quoting Smithsonian Magazine, the major countries involved in World War I were keen to avoid encouraging their enemies, so reports of the extent of the flu were suppressed in Germany, Austria, France, the United Kingdom, and the U.S. 
By contrast, neutral Spain had no need to keep the flu under wraps. That created the false impression that Spain was bearing the brunt of the disease. In fact, the geographic origin of the flu is debated to this day, although hypotheses have suggested East Asia, Europe, and even Kansas, end quote. And the particular strain of influenza that caused the pandemic wasn't necessarily that different than other strains. It was definitely more lethal, but its spread was exacerbated by overcrowding in military camps, poor sanitation and nutrition during wartime hardship, and, as one hypothesis suggests, even aspirin poisoning. Some medical authorities at the time were prescribing as much as 30 grams of aspirin per day to help treat the flu. Today, for reference, we would consider 4 grams as the maximum limit for a single day. And many of the symptoms of aspirin poisoning, like bleeding, correspond with the symptoms of that strain of influenza. But high death rates were still common in places that didn't prescribe such high doses of aspirin, so take that theory with a grain of salt. You've likely heard a lot about a possible second wave of coronavirus coming this fall or winter, and one reason some experts have been saying that is because that's what happened with the 1918 flu pandemic. The first wave in the spring of 1918 had a, well, relatively low fatality rate, but when a second wave hit that fall, the fatalities rose sharply. Scientists believe now that this was caused in large part due to the overcrowding at hospitals and military camps, which increased the spread, particularly in people with severe cases, while those with more mild cases were staying at home. There was also a third wave in the spring of 1919, which was worse than the first wave, but not nearly so bad as the second. Today, we're hoping to avoid the worst of subsequent waves by finding effective treatments and, ideally, a vaccine. But they didn't have immunizations or antiviral treatments in 1918, so how did the flu eventually stop? Quoting Smithsonian, Exposure to prior strains of the flu may have offered some protection. For example, soldiers who had served in the military for years suffered lower rates of death than new recruits. In addition, the rapidly mutating virus likely evolved over time into less lethal strains. This is predicted by models of natural selection. Because highly lethal strains kill their host rapidly, they cannot spread as easily as less lethal strains. End quote. And while looking back, it can sometimes seem like everyone who caught the flu passed away, it actually had about an 80% survival rate. Of course, a 20% fatality rate is still massive, especially in the context of the numbers we're keeping track of today with regards to coronavirus. And unlike the coronavirus, which has the highest fatality rate among seniors, the 1918 influenza was particularly deadly for otherwise healthy young adults. With half a billion people around the world infected when all was said and done, and as much as 5% of the population having passed away, the 1918 flu pandemic killed more people than World War I. Yet we don't hear that much about it, compared to other points in history with equally large impacts, and that's something I've wondered about a lot in these last few months. But recently, I saw a conversation on Twitter that shed some light on this topic. People were talking about how much they don't want to see TV shows or movies about this time period we're living through. How it just feels like too much. Living it now is too much. We don't need fictional versions or even reality show reflections. Maybe the people who lived through the 1918 pandemic felt that way too. And so not as many stories were produced or archived, and over the years it became more of a footnote than its own chapter. I don't know, just something to think about. With a lot of TV shows suspending their seasons or continuing them remotely, as is the case with shows like Saturday Night Live and American Idol, and the fall season TV lineups uncertain, a new renaissance of animation might be in our futures. Unlike live-action TV, animation can largely be done remotely. Voiceover actors can craft home studios, animators can set up their computers and gear at home, and much of this was already happening before. Mike McMahon, showrunner for the Hulu original Solar Opposites and the upcoming Star Trek Lower Decks, estimates that around 600 animation professionals are working remotely on his shows alone. He said, quote, The pandemic was about as much of a disruption as a really bad rainstorm that knocks out power for an hour, end quote. And quoting the Wall Street Journal, The resilience of the medium stands in contrast to the rest of the television and film industry. 
In March, the International Alliance of Theatrical Stage Employees Union estimated that about 120,000 film industry workers had lost their jobs because of the shutdown. In April, the Writers Guild of America advised its members to consider pursuing work on animated projects, end quote. And animation has seen a 22% increase in viewership since lockdowns began in the U.S., according to Real Good, more than any other category. And while part of that is due to kids staying home and needing entertainment, it's also a popular form of escapism for adults, especially in these difficult times. In addition to animated series having more certain futures than live-action shows, for example, The Simpsons, Family Guy, and Bob's Burgers have all officially been announced as returning this fall, a few live-action shows have also started incorporating animation to fill the gap caused by lockdown halts in production. NBC's The Blacklist completed an unfinished episode by supplementing what they'd already shot with comic book-style animated sequences. And Pop TV's One Day at a Time plans to premiere a fully animated special this summer. As voice actors get used to becoming ad hoc audio engineers and animators and producers get accustomed to a more remote workflow without the ease of popping into each other's offices for quick reviews, we'll probably continue to see more and more animation incorporated into, or perhaps even replacing, live action shows. Gloria Calderon Collette, the showrunner for One Day at a Time, mused, quote, I'd definitely watch an animated Better Call Saul or an animated Ozark. And if all of this animation talk is in any way making you nostalgic for the Saturday morning cartoons of yore, check out the link in the show notes to a high-powered mashup of cartoon theme songs from the early 90s put together by London-based DJ Geggs. If you, like me, are still having trouble getting a delivery slot for groceries, or if restaurant delivery options are sparse in your area, why not try buying your food on Etsy? Yeah, Etsy, the crafting, DIY, vintage marketplace, apparently has a secret trove of not really advertised and seemingly not regulated food being sold by individuals around the world. David Murphy from Lifehacker recently stumbled upon this strange corner of the popular site for independent makers. Murphy notes that you're not going to find anything particularly perishable and warns that different states have different laws about what can actually be sold and shipped versus exchanged in person. And also, Etsy doesn't appear to have any verification requirements to give you peace of mind about food safety. But hey, if you're up for an adventure, you could take your pick of hot sauces, yeasts, gummy treats, trail mixes, fudge, baklava, pierogies, candied bacon, Oreo cheesecake cookies, a pound of homemade teriyaki beef jerky, leaf lard, 100-year-old sourdough starters, My Little Pony cookies, straight-up cans of Progresso soup and Bush's beans being advertised as vintage, and a whole boneless ham being sold for $1,800 by a stapler store. I also found a premium pandemic breakfast gift basket, which, okay, sure. So if you're bored with your local delivery offerings or just plain bored and want to take a risk on some bespoke groceries, why don't you give Etsy a whirl? That is all for today. As always, this show is produced by Ride Home Media. I'm Jackson Bird. I hope you have a good rest of your day, and I'll talk to you tomorrow.